Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Oshman family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Oshman family JCC is an incubator for new expressions of Jewish identity. It creates innovative Jewish learning, celebrations, and arts programs that inspire personal connections to people and ideas from across the Jewish world. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 134, God on a Desert Island. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rothberg. And this week, we are continuing to look for God in the more mystical realms of Judaism. Our guest today is Andrew Hahn, also known as the Kirtan Rabbi. Andrew Hahn holds a PhD in Jewish thought from the Jewish Theological Seminary of the Conservative Movement, has rabbinical ordination from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion of Reform Judaism, and has also studied with Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, the founder of the Jewish Renewal Movement. He has been known for a long time as the Kirtan Rabbi, thanks to his use of a particular call and response chant technology from India known as Kirtan. He has recorded three albums, Kirtan Rabbi Live, Achat Sha'alti, and Non-Dual. In addition to his explicitly Jewish pursuits, Andrew Hahn has also been a teacher of martial arts for more than 30 years. He travels extensively, bringing Hebrew Kirtan, Jewish meditation, and the wisdom and learning of Torah to Jewish institutions and yoga studios across the world. Andrew Hahn, welcome to Judaism Unbound. It's so great to have you. It is great to be here. It's interesting because I am talking to you now as, you know, co-host of this podcast, but I first met you as a student in your class. And I kind of wanted to start there because the class's title um, might be a new concept for people. The class's title was non-dualism. And we're here in this God unit. And I've I've actually sort of mentioned at some point on the podcast the idea of non-dualism or sort of this expansive thinking about what God might be. But I'd love to hear from you as somebody who literally has taught about this concept. What is this idea of a non-dual God and how, how and why does it matter for Jews today? I first got into the topic of non-dualism for two reasons. First of all, I was influenced by a book by Jay Michelson called Everything is God. And I was working on Hebrew chants and I had decided I wanted to make an album of chants the the theme of all of them being uh, non-dualist dualist Jewish phrases. The, the simplest way to say what non-dualism is, is, it, is to say it's not two, non-dual. It is not two. It's often thought of as meaning, uh, like the title of Jay's book, that everything is God. That In other words, that the main phrase of um, non-dualism, which you'll find again and again and again, is ein od milvado, that there is none else but, and we like to translate it you, but in, technically it says there is none else but him, that God is all there is. And that, that is a sense that it, even though it appears that there's a world of separate things, and that you're there and I'm here or this table is here and there's a wall behind it, that in truth, this sense of being, of separation is, is an illusion. I remember even when, when Jay released his book, he was handing out a postcard saying, this postcard is God as a way to, mm-hmm. that was the postcard for advertising a party, a book release party, is that this postcard too is God. Uh, so on the one hand, um, non-dualism, just means everything is God, but it really, as I said, it means not two, which is a little more complicated than just saying all is one. And for me that I have my own little bit of a take on that. And I I feel that in some ways it is a Jewish approach, um, which is that on the one hand, everything is God, but on the other hand, many things aren't God. Or I remember once saying, thinking as a joke, I I leaned over to a friend in synagogue and and said, I want to write a book called lots of things aren't God, you know, as a response to Jay's book, everything is God. A dualist approach, there's a sense of there being God in the world and they're two separate things, or that, that they're even in the most extreme form, that there's a principle of good and a principle of evil. That's more of a Manichaeanism an ancient religion of uh, what you would call very highly extreme 
uh, I'm not even sure you would call it dualist, but for me, my mind can, can conceive and I can step back and say, everything is God. It's, or as some people like to say, it's all good, or we don't understand God's plan, but it's all for the good. But then my heart says, hey, you know, my father died. Where are you? Meaning God. Where are you? Where, where are you? you know, I know that you're everywhere, but where? And like <laughs> this tension of, I know, I know, and I know you're everything and everywhere and all is God, but where are you? I need you now. And to me, that's non-dualism. It's very hard if you just say everything's God and it's all God. Well, where's the relationship? One of the hallmark aspects of a Jewish approach to God is that it's in relationship. It's that there's always a you. There's always a, a, a capital Y, you, that is God that you can relate to, whether it's talk to or pray to. Uh, there's a you, there's a relationship. So there's a tension between this kind of third person objective point of view and then the part of relating to God that um, is crying out and saying, where are you? What are you? Uh, wh- where are you when I need you now? And you know, like the, our constant prayer of please don't abandon us. That's constantly in the Jewish prayer of please don't leave us. And to me, non-dualism may be, non-dualism writ large, may be everything is God. But a Jewish non-dualism, a Jewish concept of a non-dual God is going to contain both of these aspects. So it feels appropriate to ask a two-part question in our non-dualism, not two component of this episode. I've got a a two-parter just because I like to ask you. you But they're really all one question, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, So two parts that are one. First, this has been a great, so far we've got a bit of an overview of like what this conception is. I'm curious if you can talk about either your own take or maybe others, like how people conceptualize, like what are the ramifications of thinking of God in a non-dualist way that are different from thinking about God in a dualist way? Like what changes about one's experience of the world or of one's relationships or of one's anything based on seeing God in this different sense? So on the one hand, how do like people in the world uh, treat the ramifications of, of non-dualism in their lives? What does it, that speak to them? And on the other hand, what is it for you? And why do you have some tensions and complexities around whether you yourself are non-dualist? Well, first of all, I would say the more positive way of looking at the ramifications of holding a non-dual perspective would be the, or, or the more positive statement would be that you don't see the world and others around you as separate. You realize that any sense of separation is an illusion and will take you off, I, to use a word people use, the path or the, the, or the derech, the, the way of toward a better understanding of life and of God and, and of reality. Um, you know, the, um, and we, we learned this in our class, Lex, um, the, uh, the Tanya, who, the, who's a figure of, from um, modern Hasidism, who wrote a book called, uh, well, he called it the Sefer Tanya. You know, he says that God created a world in which there would be beings who believed themselves to be separate entities, a, a, a some things, a some things. And, uh, but, it's not, but it's not true. And then so the task becomes for the meditator to undo that creation of a world where there appears to be separation and really work your way back up to not to realize that there is no separation and but and the ramifications i mean you could say in a political way even that the ramifications would be that you would see the other more as yourself and that you you would you know when somebody's doing something that you don't understand you would you would say i i, I don't i I can understand that because there's no separation between this person and me. Another ramification of of a non-dual perspective, which goes hand in glove with what we were just saying, is that there's a sense of there not being a self. That the the sense of ani, which in Hebrew means I, is an illusion too. That that I am a separate thing. That that oh, I'm hungry. I um, there's a famous Hasidic story of somebody going, oh, I'm such a sinner. Oh, I did this. Oh, I did that. And the Rebbe, instead of saying what a good Jew this is, that he is going over all his sins, he goes, I, 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 
all this person says is I, you know, I do, I'm this. And, and in other words, he's missing the point. And the whole idea of non-dualism is there really isn't a self. And so there's this play on words that you should turn the ani uh, into the same letters, ayin, aleph yudnun, which means nothingness. In other words, disappear the self. And so one of the ramifications for me, especially as a Tai Chi practitioner, and we may get into the, my, that I have a Taoist influence, is this disappearance of all sense of self. That's another very important thing. And that allows one to join better with a community in some ways and to, to feel a sense of union with God vertically and also horizontally, which is also another form of God communally. I think I might be coming at this from the more simple-minded direction who didn't take your class. But when, when I um, think about this concept of everything is God, the thing that I start to struggle with is, you know, I mean, I really think this is a cliche, but it really is kind of where my mind goes is that if everything is God, then nothing is God. And, and I mean that in two ways. You know, one is that if everything is really God, you know, then... Um, then what are we talking about when we talk about God? You know, what what is it that we're trying to sort of get at? Why is that word even valuable? Especially since it often comes out of this context in which we were worshiping or thinking about some external being. But if we've now gotten to a place where we're saying that everything is really God, then don't we have to sort of radically rethink all the language that we use and all of the concepts that we have? So that that's the way that, you know, it sort of goes if you take the concept really deeply that everything is God. But then the other piece is, well, if everything is God, then really nothing is God. And isn't that pretty much the same as atheism? I mean, what are we really talking about if we're saying that this word that we used to think of as this other being that was in relationship with us, it turns out that uh, that other being doesn't exist. So, okay, we could say that this all is a, is a sort of a deeper idea that everything is God. But another way to think about it is like that other being that you thought was out there, it's not out there. It's a really good question. And even just to harken back to Jay Michelson, uh, I remember he was going to teach a class at uh, one of the Jewish retreat centers as, as the person who wrote the book on literally wrote the book on Jewish non-dualism and the, the title of the course was going to be, so everything is God. Now what, you know, now what do we do? Yeah, Which is exactly. essentially your question. And, uh, and, and, you know, that, what, what do we do with that? And that's the point. I, that's why I think that non-dualism isn't simply everything is God as a Jewish for want of a better term, believer in God, the, the tension, as I said, it's, it's that it is that. So now what? Because I'm, I'm here and I'm doing things and the world needs things and there's people who are hungry and, uh, and there's work that needs to be done. And so what does it do for me to, to say everything is God and then I realize that nothing is God and that nothing really is? Because the real answer to your question is nothing actually is hmm. when everything is God. And, and that's the point is to, that the only, or the only thing that is, is God. We haven't gotten to my personal point of view, but I'm not sure that I am a non-dualist in, in the purest sense of the world, word, because, which that was a very good slip, actually, in the purest sense of the world. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that I, I am a non-dualist personally because of, of the fact that, that I also have fe you know, want to feel fully and want to, and want to work and do things. And, be, and I want to, uh, and, and there's something um, nice about being in these bodies because the other thing like in the in the Taoist like in the Tai Chi practice the whole idea is to just disappear your body it is it's a tough question and the only answer I can give is that there is um, first of all it may be true that in in reality there is no separation and that and we're living in in a kind of a, the matrix all people always use that movie the matrix mm -hmm. as the as the analogy to many of these things so that you know we think we're in this world that's happening but everything is actually a completely different world but there is a time where you kind of when things are going really hard the realization that it's everything is heading towards some good goal or we don't understand the plan which or, or that all is god it can be very a, it can be very helpful emotionally, and B, and this is when, if we get into kirtan, this would be the place to go into it, is there is a certain kind of a release, which we, one could call the non-dualist experience. Freud would say, you know, disappearing into that oceanic feeling that, that you, and having glimpses of an experience, if not fuller experiences, where you really do disappear the world. 
and you and and you come back and we only get what's called a ta'am olam haba a taste of the world to come or a taste of this world but you bring it back and it enriches your life so there there's something this but from my point of view this is all to be not done in discussions like this but to be done in specific kinds of practice where words fail and concepts fail and interviews like this fail sorry because it's about an actual meditation experience or or an experience you have when when you actually are able to release completely uh the heart and the heartstrings and have a non-dual experience, as I put it before. And it can actually be very healing. And so when you come back to do your social action in the world, you can, or, or when things, we say Shabbat is like this. Shabbat is supposed to be a non-dual experience as a whole. And so when you're in the week and things are going rough, you can say, you know, on Shabbat, I had that experience and, and it's going to give me what we call chizik, you know, strengthening, chizuk. It's going to give me some strengthening to, to work through this problem of, of the work week or the problem I'm having in, in a, a, a disagreement with my partner or, or my kids are driving me crazy, whatever it may be. It's a little bit of tending to the self to have that experience. What I've got in my mind is the story at the burning bush in Exodus 6, where God says to Moses that I was known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but now I'm telling you who I really am. And, you know, this idea that at different times in in our history, there's a conception of God that is right for that time of history, but it isn't right anymore. Uh, And it isn't, and it was never actually fully uh, fully correct, you know, and I, I feel like there's a, an element here. I, I don't know if you agree with this, but I feel like there's an element here in in which there's a, a new, a different conception of God that's being advanced. But sometimes I wonder if there's a, a lack of courage in terms of being willing to move away from the fully move away from the previous conception and to say, yeah, actually, that stuff the way that we used to talk about God, that was just for a different time. And now let's just put that in the in in our in our history or in our mythology or in, you know, the stories that we tell. But here's the story going forward. And or there's a possibility that we say, you know, you know, that concept of God, it we may have learned it in a certain way from the East. We may find resonances in Hasidism. It's really powerful and we should take it seriously. And yet our Jewish conception of God is not quite that. And we have a little bit of a different take on it. So I I was actually wondering if that's an interesting, uh, valuable uh, segue into what you were talking about in terms of your own personal story and how you see the, and how you talk about yourself as not necessarily a non-dualist, as a Jewish non-dualist, th- seeing it a little bit differently. I'd love to understand sort of how you've come to all this and also sort of what is the relationship to things that you've talked about, like Tai Chi and uh, Kirtan and things that, that come from the East and that come from other religious or cultural traditions. And, and how does that all sort of fuse together in your own story and, and where you are trying to take others? So as to the question of if we were to realize that something in the tradition is just downright false or has not been true or no longer serves its purpose, I call that the Liebenson Doctrine. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a theme you like to push, I've noticed. <laughs> and, you know, that if something's not right, throw it out. You know, why we, Judaism, and I think Judaism's had a Jewish, Jewish law in particular and Jewish thought, uh, I, and I think we've had a big influence on on the West in general in this. It tends to want to rely on precedent that even if you're introducing something new, that it be backwardly compatible with what came before, and that that we are always taking in the opinions uh, of the of the prior era, even as we move forward. Where and then it's a really good question that you ask of well, if we realize something just doesn't serve or it's you know blatantly false in some way for us now why not just move on or just as i remember hearing you at a panel say something like well, let's keep the 25 percent that works and get rid of the 75 percent that doesn't i don't want to be fair i say that we should keep studying those things but not, <laughs> yeah, but not practicing really, well, them anymore i mean there yeah i mean there's the beautiful story i can't remember who it was of of the um 
a reform rabbi in the 1825 or something where uh, I, I keep wanting to, I keep wanting to write my professors to get his name. I can't remember who it was, but one of the early, early reformers who of course grew up Orthodox and he, um, for, for Yom Kippur, he cut out most of the service. So the Yom Kippur service was maybe an hour, or hour and a half long. He cut out everything and, and he was a radical, radical reformer. So, so there wasn't this full day of, Russia, of Yom Kippur services, and, and this was, he was German, but he was in Paris, I believe. And in the afternoon, some people were walking along, and they saw him sitting in a coffee shop on Yom Kippur, eating a croissant and having espresso. And, and he was the rabbi, and they came up, and they, saw, they, wa they wanted to see what he was doing. And this, I'm told, is a true story. And he, he, they looked, and they saw that he was reading through all the parts of the prayer book that he had cut out in the coffee shop. So in other words, he, he was still studying it, even though he had cut all this out, he was, hmm. he was, he was still examining the tradition. So hmm. what if we realize that we need to do that to what heretofore has been Jewish practice, that it's, that we are now in a time where, where we don't actually like the values of what fully like the values of what came before. And we need to create almost a new religion, but we feel obligated to, to refer it backwards. Um, that's a very good question, and, and it's not one I'm prepared to answer here, but I wonder in not, just to, I do wonder myself if we aren't in such a time. And that these practices from the East, which have come to influence us, are very much a part of that process. These practices are not to be shunned or looked at as foreign things or as, as, as idolatry or, or foreign fire, as they like to say, but rather they, they've come to help us move on to whatever this next phase of our practice and our, and our belief in God is going to be. I'm very grateful for, uh, for these practices. For myself personally, as I mentioned, obviously uh, the kirtan piece, and to answer your prior question, kirtan is definitely in, from Hinduism. It's not from Buddhism or anything else. It's from Hinduism. The kirtan piece is very important to me. But personally, my um, sense of where I can experience the divine, the oneness, the non-dual experience, uh, and in some ways the most meaning, I'm going to be kind of radical here as a rabbi, where I find it most is in, is in the Taoism. Uh, and for me, if I were to go be, be stranded on a desert island – by myself, I don't think I would pray. I don't think I'd daven. I don't, you know, pray a daven. I don't think I would take the, the Siddur, the Hebrew prayer book, and, and pray three times a day. I would practice Tai Chi, and I would meditate, and I would do standing practices, and I would do the, the, the Taoist practices that, I've been, that I spend much of my day doing already, because to me, they take me the closest to the truth and to, to the sense of, uh, and, and to give me a feeling that I'm really connecting with the heart of reality. And that's, you asked earlier about what are the ramifications of a non-dual vision. One experience is, wow, chi, this energy coursing through the universe is real. And I'm experiencing it and I'm able to have it and manipulate it. So for me personally, just all by myself on a desert island, uh, I probably wouldn't pray as a Jew. I might put on tefillin because I find a great power in them. That's a whole other uh, Megillah, as we would say, a whole other topic. But I'm also in a community. And when I look left and right and need to support other people who are in times of, of uh, hard times, or I need that from somebody, I find that the Jewish path works for me. See, I don't think that's radical. I, I actually, so I think in a sense it's radical, but I think that... Um, like you mentioned that if you were on a desert island, you probably wouldn't pray in a traditional Jewish sense or, or maybe, but like you couldn't in a traditional Jewish sense because you wouldn't have a minion. Yeah, uh, Like true. you wouldn't have yeah. 10 people. Like, like by definition, uh, I mean, you, you could say certain things. You don't need to have 10 people for every Jewish prayer. But like, I actually think that if you, if you offered that like Talmudic inquiry to like rabbis 1800 years ago or a thousand years ago and said like you're on a desert island what would you do as a regular jewish worship like i think that there would actually be voices in the room that say well you 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 don't say a bunch of stuff um because you can't and like it's not designed for a desert island that said i think that what might be changing is like maybe there is a sense in which people want a judaism that works on a desert island and what i mean by that is like maybe people want a judaism that works 
individually and affects a kind of personal meaning in a way that it wasn't engineered to do. And that's something that Dan has spoken about is like, maybe this, maybe this thing, this contraption of ours, this tool, this technology, whatever of Judaism, which, you know, is a manufactured concept in our mind that doesn't exist. But like, to the extent it does, maybe it wasn't made to, to achieve the kinds of personal meaning experiences that something like Tai Chi was meant to do. And I think that that's the moment where we ask some challenging questions where, where it's like, by, but by having you on a regular basis take on Tai Chi, like, are you now something that's less Jewish than you were before? Are you like more something else? Does that like, how does that sort of play in this world where we've been taught that you can only be one religion. Um, right. And by the way, the people practicing Tai Chi probably w haven't been taught that in the same way. If you're in East Asia, like there's a lot of blurring of religions um, and not the same kind of identity associations in many corners of like, I am a Taoist, I am a Buddhist, I am Absolutely. a Absolutely. There um, it really isn't, but, Hinduism really isn't a religion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, this is a ramble, but I guess what I'm asking is given the desert island piece that you brought us, which I think is so powerful, and we could tie it to the whole joke of you're on a desert island and you make the synagogue that you don't <laughs> go to and the synagogue that you do. Like that's actually, that's another argument that even when you're by yourself, you would create like a mock community because that's like what Judaism is wired to do in a sense. Um, what does that tell us about both the deficiencies, like the real deficiencies, like I think it's important to say, like what we're not good at historically in Judaism. Like, what does that tell us about real deficiencies of Judaism that we might need to like supplement with vitamins from from other world? And also, what does that tell us about the power of transcending divides between two religions? And also, maybe as a throw in, like what are the dangers there of appropriation and otherwise that start to creep in? I'll just share with you a story. Uh, after I um, recorded my first album in 2000, 10 years ago uh, at B'nai Jeshurun Synagogue in New York, and there was a party, somebody was having a party a few days later, and this young man came up to me who lived in Israel, American, came up to me and said, Rabbi, with all due respect, and you know, as a rabbi, when you hear that, you know you're getting no respect. Uh, <laughs> rabbi, with all due respect, why did you have to say that it came from India? Why didn't we have this in Judaism? Why did you have to say that? And I remember saying to him first on the A, because it does, you know, <laughs> we do have kinds of hints of call and response chanting in our tradition that we can now look to find now that we get it from somewhere else. We can look back and go, oh, there it is. But the truth is it did come from India. And then I also wanted to say, this is the way it's always been. Mm -hmm. There's no pure, correct Judaism. And I wanted to say to him, so I suppose you, you think and you like to sing Adon Alam, which is one of our main hymns in the synagogue at the end of a service, that you like to sing this song, Adon Alam, to a Prussian marching tune. You know, oh, that's Jewish. But no, at that time, there was probably somebody going, no, this is an innovation that shouldn't be allowed. Uh, but I, I think, Lex, your point is really, really well taken, is that I think people do want now, and we are in an age, and you could look at it as a very individualistic age. Uh, worst case, you could look at it even as a narcissistic or selfish age. But whatever the case may be, we're in a new time now where the old ways aren't working. And people do want some of that desert island experience that I spoke of before. Of They, they do want... Jewish practice to provide that for an increasing number of people, especially people who are on the fringes and who are exploring other traditions to find it if they can't find it in Judaism. This age is an age where people more need to feel like personally they're experiencing God directly and that even they're horizontally, collectively having that experience while in Sangha, as they say, or in community, Sangha is a Sanskrit word for, for being in community, uh, they want to experience that in, in both. And this is where um, the main thing I have done as a rabbi, uh, bringing in, the, in what we call Hebrew or Jewish kirtan, this practice that does come out of Hinduism, which is the call and response singing, and much more, much more than just that, but the simplest form of it being call and response, is that what makes, has made kirtan become so popular in America, also in Sanskrit, is that people go there and they know they're, they are going to have an experience of God directly. Can you describe a little bit about sort of what 
kirtan is and other practices that you think are important to describe because I think that a lot of us don't really even know what it is and can then can you describe a little bit about how you've experienced that Jews in particular do you have these kinds of experiences of direct connect to God or whatever other kinds of experiences that they're not having through traditional, more traditional Jewish uh, experiences? Could you just describe some some sense of how people respond to this and, and why you think so? Kirtan, as I said before, is a form of chanting that is most is basically call and response chant. Uh, where one person sings a line and everyone sings it back and you keep singing it and there's variations and sometimes the variations are followed and then they're not. And then if you, if, and, and it keeps going and it builds and it builds and it builds and you're singing very, very short snippets of words. Now, Kirtan comes from um, the Hindu tradition. So traditionally it's done in Sanskrit and usually what are chant, what it is chanted uh, in, at Kirtans are various names of God. So it might be that, that, that and, they, and there are many names of God in, in or apparently there's many names of God in Hinduism. So there, there are many different kinds of chants and what they call mantras or, or certain established chants through the ages that you chant again and again and again and again. And the whole idea is to just keep repeating, keep repeating until you leave the words or the names themselves and they bring you into an, a direct experience uh, in community with God. And, and of, of something very powerful. And people feel their hearts open up because kirtan is also, they, they call it bhakti yoga. It's a form of yoga. And it's, bhakti yoga means um, ecstatic or devotional yoga. And it's considered to be a higher form for the age that we're in, in the Hindu calendar or the Hindu millennia. Uh, it's considered to be the highest practice, higher than the, what we think of as yoga as holding positions. And that's called more of a kind called hatha yoga. And uh, so I'll often lead kirtans with Jewish people and explain this, you know, at synagogues. And I'll say, now I invite you all to slouch back in your seats and do yoga because it's, it's not necessarily about holding these positions or being in perfect posture. But it is about allowing the heart to break open and release all the emotions so you can get beyond. Um, I've gone to Sanskrit kirtans, but as somebody brought up Jewish and who really connects with the with feeling Jewish and with the Jewish tradition, it's so much, I get so much more out of it chanting words in the Hebrew tradition. Um, it's not the result or what are we trying to do or where are we trying to go or what are we trying to produce in ourselves? I find a lot of, I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately. I'm going to write a blog on it. Um, I find a lot of the, uh, even in a certain Jewish renewal, more out, you know, more influenced traditions of Judaism, like renewal, which are more influenced by Eastern stuff that I find that the, 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 the service leaders are too, for want of a better word, controlling and too directive. And like, we're going to do this now and here's, and don't do that, do this. This is the right way. This is the wrong way. Uh, now you're going to feel this in your right lung as you do this, as we do this ritual. And then, then you're going to feel this in your left earlobe. I'm, I'm obviously caricaturizing and I'm sorry to my friends, but it's, but the point is I, with Kirtan, it, it you just throw a lot of stuff against a barn wall and see what happens. It's about the practice. And I was say, I have recently come under the influence of a, of a new Tai Chi teacher, a man named Adam Meisner. And I was just at a workshop with his, of his, and it, he said something really, really profound. And again, this is coming from the Tai Chi world. He said, focus on the causes. Don't focus on the effects. Just do the method, do the practice, and observe. Observe what happens. Observe the effects. He says, the moment you try to dictate what the outcome is or say, I want this to happen, you've created a new cause. Mm. You've created a new cause and then you have to observe that effect. So it, it's Kirtan for me, it's a very pure way for me to give Torah over, as it were, because all I do is focus on here's the chant, here are the few words. I don't know where it's going to go. It's very improvisatory and it's very much I'm listening to what's going on either on in the backup musicians or what's going on in the crowd and taking leads and cues from that. And it's just do it. It's the Nike practice. Just do it. I think that there's so many pieces that you've brought that are just really powerful. And what's maybe it's strange, maybe it's not. Um, I'm thinking 
I mean, look, I'm I'm a rabbinical student uh, in in many rooms like you're describing, where there are where people have put a lot of thought and they really care about you know nailing their services. What they're terrified of is that if they're fully open and fully allow the room to go wherever it will go, it will go nowhere. Uh, that it w- it will just sort of like there won't be a lot of emotion or there won't be a lot of ex- ecstatic experience or anything. And that's a devastating, scary experience when you've been taught as a prayer leader that your role is to sort of like take the room to a place. So that's one theory I had about like why the diagnosis that you're making is happening because you're obviously totally right. Um, But I wanted to shift gears because I've noticed that the word should hasn't come out of your mouth very much. But I'm going to sort of push and say, are there sort of shoulds that you would put onto the table? Here's how folks are currently relating to God or relating to the idea of hybridized religion or whatever it is. Like, here's where they currently are. I would like to see a should. They, they should do X differently. Jews, the world, whatever. Because um, you really have practiced what you preached and just sort of noticed where people are. But where, where might people benefit from going? What are the, some of those shoulds? To go back to the... the the what we call the shaliach tzibur's dilemma, or the shaliach tzibur means the literally the emissary of the public. So that's the service leader, and and the feeling like it's it's a very beginner feeling to think if I don't if I need to control the room or it's going to go nowhere. Um, a slightly more advanced but also problematic to me um, point of view is that if you don't control the room, it could be dangerous. And uh, it, that, it, that you actually, you know, you have to create a safe container. How many times have you heard that, that it, that's necessary as a service leader to create, make sure it's a safe container. And I think that's an important thing. So you're asking about what the shoulds might be in all of this, because, and I take it as quite a compliment that I, that the word should has not appeared very much up, up to this point in the conversation, because I think that is, that is the important piece. But, you know, in a certain way I've said, I believe pretty firmly I don't want to say should here, but it should's too strong, but I believe it's very helpful to people to find a personal practice, something they can do. And kirtan won't be it. You can't do kirtan by yourself, but you know, whether it's meditation, davening, it could be any, it could be prayer. It could be a tea ceremony, but I think that is that human beings need to find something for themselves. That's all for themselves and is a personal practice that they can do every day. So uh, I am my new my new and this is sort of a should my new mantra or my new slogan is teaching kirtan is you have to be the chant you want to see in the world and that's a should because it means that if you are going if you're going to provide a container that takes people to a certain place you have to have, you you probably should have been there yourself before and if you're like if you're going to take on the practice of leading kirtan i would recommend going to kirtans there are many many people who start leading kirtan have never been to a, an actual sanskrit kirtan or any other kirtan at just being in the kahal just being in the audience and before i dared to even try a little tiny kirtan with some friends back in 2005 or something i had already been to 50 or 100 kirtans i went to observe and and watch I just sort of wish that the question of how to make Jewish services safe was the question that we were asking, you know, as opposed to how to make them at all meaningful or valuable. You know, it's like I I, I hadn't thought about it before in terms of safety, you know, and, and if that's the right frame through which to look at whatever type of religious experience or ecstatic experience might happen in a Jewish service, it strikes me that we're playing it away too safe, you know, because um, it's it's so far from any possibility of that happening in so many Jewish services that it feels like what what you described earlier that that individual experience is almost not possible. It's not it's not impossible because some people are able to experience it in in the the way that you know services usually are happening. But I feel like that's the exception that proves the rule. And obviously, if you were trying to do something risky, there's also the the risk that it goes wrong. And sure, you want to have people who know how to manage that. But I wish that that was even the conversation that we were having. I, I wish that that was even a possibility that we were navigating. There is a fear that if you just jump into these ecstatic direct practices without any training, without any knowledge, that you could, something dangerous could happen. And that, and that 
you know, you might get absorbed into God and go crazy if, if you would. Uh, and that's, that's a, that is a very important discussion to have. I remember that when I did my first kirtan at a renewal retreat, one of the rabbis came up to me and said, you know, you, can, you have a huge responsibility there and use that term, you know, you need to make this safe and make, provide a safe container. And I could tell that the service had, had freaked, my kirtan had freaked her out. Getting back to the your shoulds, Lex, I mean, that's, all of this is very important that one find a way to make it safe and to measure it properly and, and meet it out, meet it out properly. This tension is not a bad tension of a service that both has its structure and, and you know you can fall back into the net, the safety net of the structure when you need to, but yet we need a service that also allows clear openings and space for those who are ready and at that moment ready to have a direct experience. And I think you're right, Dan, that um, traditionally and especially in, in the post-World War II world, I think, and in many uh, corners of Judaism, the sir, we haven't had this discussion and that of how does this, how can we create a service that is both referential and deferential to what came before, and at the same time is new in the sense that it's allowing the longings and the needs of this age where people want and need direct connection to God to be able to happen. And they don't want to necessarily have to go off to another tradition to find it, nor do they necessarily want to have to go off to that desert island that I spoke of to find it. They want it in community, and, and they don't necessarily have to expect it every single time they enter those doors, but they want that if they're in a place where they want that, that there's space for that, and there's a possibility of having that experience. And I think this is a very important conversation, and I believe that this conversation is occurring because of the influence of other traditions that have in our global village that have come to us, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, mindfulness meditation, Taoism, Zen, and, and just as we have benefited from contact with Islam and Christianity and Greek religions before that, all through our history, we have benefited from the contact with these with these other forms of practice. And now we're in a, this global village where, where we have choices. And if our own tradition isn't going to answer the call of our age, then people are going to go find it elsewhere. Well, thank you so much, Kirtan Rabbi Andrew Hahn, for joining us. It's been a great episode. Great. And thanks, of course, also to all of you out there listening. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and we hope that you'll stay along with us for the remainder of our unit on God. Uh, we've got a bunch of great episodes coming up. So thanks again for listening, and we want to close out this episode in the way that we always do by encouraging you to be in touch with us. And there are a variety of ways for you to do that. First, you can head to our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. Second, you can head to Twitter at at Judaism Unbound. Third, you can go to our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And last but not least, we really would love you to email us at dan at judaismunbound.com or lex at judaismunbound.com. The last plug we like to make is that you can always support us with a financial donation, either on a one-time basis or a monthly recurring basis. And both of those options are available at judaismunbound.com slash donate. So thanks so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound. <laughs>